Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel, and today's topic of discussion is asynchronous or induction generators. Our objective is to examine asynchronous generators on an introductory level. We'll explore their mechanical and electrical characteristics and discuss their advantages and disadvantages. Additionally, we'll explore a neat application of asynchronous generators beyond the obvious application of powering modern society. This lecture operates under the presumption that viewers watch the squirrel cage induction motor, mechanical and electrical characteristics lectures, both available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If you haven't watched these lectures yet, only dimly recall their contents, please take the time to do so now. As you are no doubt aware, motors and generators are dual aspects of a single entity that might more holistically be considered a rotating electrical machine. Motors are rotating electrical machines that convert electrical power input into rotational mechanical power output. In contrast, generators are rotating electrical machines that convert rotating mechanical power input into electrical power output. Over the course of the previous lectures, we've primarily explored the motor aspect of rotating electrical machines. Our task today is to correct this oversight and explore generators. Again, generators are rotating electrical machines that convert rotational mechanical power input into electrical power output. Some external mechanical power source known as a prime mover, like falling water, blowing wind, expanding steam, or an internal combustion engine drives the shaft of a generator with given torque and rotational speed and electrical power comes out. Quite like motors, there are three phase AC, single phase AC, and DC generators, each with their own distinguishing characteristics. The type of generators we'll be discussing today, asynchronous or induction generators, are found within the three phase AC branch of the rotating electrical machine family tree. The three-phase AC branch is divided into two sub-branches, induction and synchronous generators. Each of these sub-branches have two additional sub-branches. Induction generators might either be a traditional induction or asynchronous generator, the topic of today's discussion, or a doubly fed induction generator. Synchronous generators, in contrast, might be electrically excited synchronous generators or permanent magnet synchronous generators. We'll examine these other types of generators in greater detail in later lectures, however it's probably worth a moment of our time to compare and contrast these principal types of generators on an extremely introductory level before we dive into the details of one type or another. The induction versus synchronous split tells us something interesting about these two principal styles of three-phase AC generators, notably how the speed of the rotor relates to the stator. The rotors of synchronous generators match or are synchronized with the stator whereas the rotors of induction style generators are not, hence the term asynchronous, i.e. without synchronization. Alternatively, these are known as induction style generators, implying they operate off the principle of induction. Induction, you'll recall, necessitates a changing magnetic field, hence the rotors of induction style generators must be driven faster than the rotating magnetic field in the stator. This is essentially opposite of what we learned about squirrel cage induction motors in the aforementioned lectures. You recall the rotors of squirrel cage induction motors must necessarily lag the synchronous speed produced by the stator, even in the unloaded state. This degree of lag is sometimes expressed as slip, being a percentage of synchronous speed. Asynchronous generators must also exhibit slip to export electrical power, only they must do so in a leading fashion. A generator rotor matching or moving slower than the stator rotating magnetic field isn't a generator, it's a motor. Only when some outside prime mover with sufficient mechanical power grabs the shaft and accelerates it faster than the stator synchronous speed does it become a generator. Again, this is an important point I must reiterate. The synchronous speed serves as an important dividing line. A rotor spinning below the synchronous speed places in an induction machine in motor mode. Conversely, a rotor spinning above the synchronous speed places in an induction machine in generator mode. The outside force of the prime mover, whatever it might be, must exert sufficient effort to push the rotor past the magnetic field in the stator, implying that there's a finite amount of mechanical power that can be extracted from the prime mover and the shaft of a generator doesn't spin freely. This is something the bogus free energy machines you see routinely advertised in the more dubious corners of the internet so conveniently neglect. Any inefficiency in the conversion from mechanical power input to electrical power output would be considered a loss. Losses always occur and you can't get more out than what came in. Besides the rotor and stator speed relationship, another defining feature of the synchronous versus induction split is a particular generator's ability to stand alone. 
As we'll learn in later lectures, synchronous generators are black start capable, meaning from utter darkness, i.e. a grid in a completely depowered state, they can begin generation even if in isolation. A vast majority of large mission critical generators like hydropower dams and coal-fired power plants are synchronous generators. Asynchronous generators, in contrast, necessitate connection to an existing power grid for them to work at all, i.e. it takes power to make power. If the grid is down, an asynchronous generator cannot be used to restart it barring exotic mechanisms. As we'll soon learn, the power an asynchronous generator necessarily draws for operation is direct towards a reactive interchange and goes towards establishing the rotating magnetic field in the stator. This implies asynchronous generators must continually consume reactive power even when exporting real electrical power for use. Synchronous generators, in contrast, can operate at unity power factor given proper control mechanisms. Because of this important distinction, you'll often find synchronous and asynchronous generators working together. Some large, expensive, complicated synchronous generator goes towards establishing the grid, and then numerous smaller, inexpensive, and comparatively simpler asynchronous generators use this established grid connection to come online and help share the load. An example might be a small collection of large synchronous generators at some hydropower dam establishing a grid with a stable voltage magnitude, frequency, and phase shift, and then a couple wind farms with a hundred smaller, cheaper asynchronous generators using this existing grid connection to establish a rotating magnetic field in their respective stators to generate electrical power asynchronously. Lacking the existing grid connection established by the larger, expensive, complicated synchronous generators, the numerous inexpensive smaller asynchronous generators simply won't work. Conversely, lacking the numerous inexpensive smaller asynchronous generators, the larger expensive complicated synchronous generators wouldn't be able to handle the load. Working together, not only do they do the job, they do the job cheaply. This however does not stop hydropower and wind turbine technicians from engaging in open mockery of each other. Ask me how I know. I should note not all hydropower installations are synchronous nor are all wind turbines asynchronous. This is a very simple example at best and not meant to be taken as a fixed truth for any and all scenarios. We'll examine hydropower and industrial wind power in greater detail in later lectures. If we were to go further into the specifics about these four main types of three-phase AC generators, we find all of them possessing stators essentially indistinguishable from one another. Besides their operational differences, really only the design of the rotor physically distinguishes one type of machine from another. The rotor of an asynchronous generator, for all intents and purposes, is constructed exactly like the rotor of a squirrel cage induction motor, being a cast aluminum or copper cage-like structure, often embedded in laminated sheets of iron designed to concentrate the magnetic field. These types of rotors are mechanically simple and necessitate no external electrical connections. This fact makes asynchronous generators reliable and inexpensive. In fact, an off-the-shelf squirrel cage induction motor can be used as a generator if the need arises with little if any modification. We'll examine other types of generators, including their identifying rotors and operating characteristics in greater detail in later lectures. In summary, these characteristics define asynchronous generators. One, the rotor of an asynchronous generator like that of a squirrel cage induction motor, is mechanically simple, inexpensive, and necessitates no electrical connection. Two, the state of an asynchronous generator must be powered by an existing grid connection, i.e. it takes power to make power. The reactive power drawn by an asynchronous generator goes towards establishing the rotating magnetic field on the stator. This implies asynchronous generators always consume reactive power even when exporting real electrical power for use. And finally, three, some external prime mover must drive the rotor of an asynchronous generator faster than the stator, i.e. possess a leading slip for the principle of induction to work. Before we begin our scheduled discussion of asynchronous generation, let's first do a quick review of polarity conventions, electrical power, and mechanical power. Trust me, this brief review sets us up for a hopefully easy discussion of what might ordinarily be considered an extremely complicated topic. Follow me, if you will, on a brief tour of your existing knowledge. You'll no doubt recall way, way back in the basic electrical circuit analysis class, I introduced the concept of polarity for active sources and passive elements. An active source, like a battery, consumes chemical power 
and exports electrical power to a circuit. An active source is characterized as a voltage rise from negative to positive and is identified as forcing conventional current out of it such that the current leaves the positive terminal and returns via the negative terminal. Again, active sources supply electrical power. In contrast, a passive element consumes electrical power. For example, a resistor is a passive element that converts electrical power to heat. A passive element is characterized as a voltage drop from positive to negative and identified as conventional current traveling into it, such that current enters the positive terminal and leaves the negative terminal. Again, passive elements consume electrical power. Once we got through the basics of DC circuit analysis, we expanded our knowledge to include discussions about energy storage elements like capacitors and inductors. While charging, a capacitor stores energy in an electrostatic field and appears to be a passive element which consumes electrical power. While discharging, a capacitor releases that same energy stored in an electrostatic field and appears to be an active source which supplies electrical power. Similarly, while storing energy in an expanding magnetic field, an inductor appears to be a passive element which consumes electrical power. While releasing that same stored energy from a collapsing magnetic field, an inductor appears to be an active source which supplies electrical power. Energy storage elements like capacitors and inductors alternatively store and return energy. Thus, they bridge the definition of active sources and passive elements. For this reason, capacitors and inductors are sometimes called reactive elements. After some introductory lessons on sinusoidal properties, we again expanded our knowledge to include discussions of AC power, of which there are two types, real and reactive. Real power is consumed by a device and goes to work. Reactive power, in contrast, is cyclically exchanged with the source. On a very basic level, time-variant AC power is a product of instantaneous sinusoidal voltage and instantaneous sinusoidal current, where the degree of phase shift between voltage and current determines how much of apparent power is directed towards real power or a reactive interchange. The current through a resistor is always in phase with the voltage across it. Passive elements like resistors always consume positive real power and no power is directed towards a reactive interchange. In contrast, current through purely reactive elements like capacitors and inductors either leads or lags voltage across it by a full 90 degrees. Pure reactive elements direct all power towards a reactive interchange. Periods of positive power coincide with the reactive element acting like a passive element consuming power, whereas periods of negative power coincide with the reactive element acting like an active source supplying power. In a perfect world, the periods of positive power consumption are equal in magnitude and duration to the periods of negative power supply. Reactive elements essentially bounce power back and forth, and in the end, no real work gets done. Aside from pure capacitors and pure inductors, most real-world components are a mix of resistive and reactive natures. Consider these plots of voltage across, current through, and power consumed by a motor winding in a lightly loaded condition. Motor windings can be considered a mixture of resistive and inductive elements. The resistive portion accounts for usable power and losses whereas the inductive portion accounts towards establishing the rotating magnetic field central to a motor's operation. You will note that periods of positive voltage and positive current coincide with positive power, as do periods of negative voltage and negative current. These are those periods when the winding behaves like a passive element and consumes power, some of which is directed towards losses, some towards usable mechanical power output. Conversely, periods of positive voltage and negative current or negative voltage and positive current coincide with negative power. These are those periods when the winding behaves like an active source returning or supplying power to the source. In the end, there's an average consumption of positive real power as evidenced by the center line of the time variant power waveform. This average value is the real power portion of apparent power. Conversely, the periodic pulses of excess positive and excess negative power exchanged between the motor and the supply are those reactive interchanges that, while they do not contribute to actual usable output, are central to the operation of the motor and go towards establishing the rotating magnetic field. These diagrams of voltage, current, and power are pretty key to our later discussions on asynchronous generators, so it might be worth a moment of your time to pause the lecture and stare at them until you appreciate them on every level that I do. 
Again, periods of positive voltage and positive current coincide with positive power, as do periods of negative voltage and negative current. These are those periods when an element consumes power. Conversely, periods of positive voltage and negative current or negative voltage and positive current coincide with negative power. These are those periods when a device returns or supplies electrical power. As we'll soon learn, asynchronous generators experience more periods of negative electrical power than they do positive, i.e. it exports real electrical power. Lastly, let's review mechanical power. You recall in the Rotating Mechanical Power lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel, we learned to calculate rotating mechanical power in units of watts as torque T in units of newton meters times rotational speed N in units of RPM divided by the constant 9.55. Additionally, we recall, we arbitrarily established a polarity convention where positive is clockwise and negative is counterclockwise. Consider a speed torque profile of a motor rotating the positive clockwise direction producing positive clockwise torque. Positive times positive yields positive mechanical power output. Similarly, consider this same motor rotating in the negative counterclockwise direction, producing negative counterclockwise torque. Negative times negative yields positive mechanical power output. In summary, motors always produce torque in the direction of rotation and always yield positive mechanical power output. Given this power dust doesn't come from nowhere, a motor consumes positive electrical power input and produces an equal amount of positive mechanical power output minus losses. Generators are different than motors. A generator being turned in the positive clockwise direction resists the prime mover's effort with negative counterclockwise counter torque or braking action. Positive speed times negative torque yields negative mechanical power output. Similarly, a generator being turned by a prime mover in the negative counterclockwise direction resists with positive clockwise counter torque or braking action. Negative speed times positive torque yields negative mechanical power output. In summary, generators always produce torque counter to the direction of rotation and always yield negative mechanical power output. What in the hell is negative mechanical power output? Negative mechanical power output is simply a roundabout way of saying a generator consumes mechanical power input. Given a generator converts mechanical power to electrical power, following this somewhat awkward polarity convention, we can say the generator consumes negative electrical power input. Again, what the hell is negative electrical power input? Negative electrical power input is simply a circuitous way of saying generator produces electrical power output. Trust me, I don't like this polarity shell game as much as you, but I will grudgingly admit it yields consistent, usable results. Again, motors consume electrical power input and produce mechanical power output. Generators, in contrast, consume mechanical power input and produce electrical power output. The polarity convention allows us to remain consistent and will be very useful in the very, very near future. All right, with this newly refreshed understanding of polarity conventions, electrical and mechanical power, let's take a quick look at the mechanical and electrical properties of a score cage induction motor, focusing on five conditions in the far right side of the speed torque curve from the no load through the rated condition to peak or breakdown torque. Yes, I know this lecture is supposed to be about induction generators, but these five quick motor examples sets us up perfectly for a later discussion on generators. Trust me, it'll be worth the wait. Anticipation, as they say, is part of showmanship. Assuming you've watched the aforementioned mechanical and electrical properties of squirrel cage induction motors lectures, we should expect some predictable results as we travel from a no load condition through the rated condition to breakdown. Notably, as torque increases, speed will decrease, slip will increase, and mechanical power will increase. Electrically, we should expect current magnitude to increase, real electrical power input should increase, Reactive power should remain relatively constant. Phase shift should decrease, corresponding to an increased power factor. And lastly, we should observe 0% efficiency at no load conditions, increasing efficiency as we increasingly load the motor, peaking at or around the rated condition, followed by decreasing efficiency as we approach breakdown. Let's see if this is the case. During this exercise, we'll make use of a 200 watt Y configured three phase AC squirrel cage induction motor with a synchronous speed of 1800 RPM intended to operate using a light industrial 120 volt line to neutral 
208 volt line to line 60 hertz three phase AC. Consider this plot of voltage in red, current in blue, and power in purple for one winding of this motor in the unloaded condition. The plots of the other two Y configure windings are essentially duplicates of the same one, only phase shifted by a relative 120 degrees. In the unloaded condition, the motor spins relatively quickly at 1770 RPM, but produces no usable torque. You know, even in the unloaded condition, the no load speed is slightly less than the synchronous speed of the stator with a slip of roughly 1.7%. An application of the mechanical power equation demonstrates this motor is producing zero watts of mechanical power output. Well, that's what you'd expect. It's the unloaded condition. This being said, it's still drawing current. On the order of 720 milliampers, with a pretty large phase shift of 65 degrees, synonymous with a super low power factor, all the while experiencing the line to neutral differential of 120 volts. As in our previous review, some pretty understandable electrical interactions are occurring here. Periods of positive voltage and positive current coincide with positive power, as do periods of negative voltage and negative current. These are those periods when the winding consumes electrical power. In the end, there's an average consumption of positive real power as evidenced by the center line of the time variant power waveform on the order of maybe 34-ish watts for this single winding. Given this is one of three identical windings, the motor is consuming around three times 34, or maybe around 100 watts of real electrical power in the unloaded condition. Keep in mind, it's not doing anything. Conversely, periods of positive voltage and negative current, or negative voltage and positive current coincide with negative power. These are those periods when the winding supplies electrical power. These periodic pulses of excess positive and negative reactive power don't contribute to actual usable output. However, they're supremely necessary in establishing the rotating magnetic field. For this single winding, this amounts to roughly 80-ish vars. Given this is one of three identical windings, the motor is consuming three times 80, or roughly 240 vars of reactive power. In summary, in the unloaded condition, the motor produces zero watts of mechanical power output and consumes 100 watts of electrical power input. This amounts to an efficiency of 0%. Again, it's the unloaded condition, and this shouldn't be a surprise. A majority of apparent power, on the order of 240 vars, is directed towards a reactive interchange essential to the establishing a rotating magnetic field. Now consider these same plots of voltage, current, and power when I lightly load the motor so it produces 0.5 newton meters of torque. Speed drops to 1759 RPM, and slip increases to 2.3%. In application of the mechanical power equation, demonstrates the motor is producing roughly 92 watts of mechanical power output. Current magnitude increases to 758 milliampers with a decreasing phase shift of 62 degrees corresponding to increased power factor. As previously, periods of positive voltage and positive current coincide with positive power, as do periods of negative voltage and negative current. Looks like the center line of the time variant waveform increased to 43-ish watts for the single winding. Given this one of three identical windings, the motor is consuming three times 43 roughly 128 watts of real electrical power. Compared to the previous unloaded condition, real electrical power consumption increases. Conversely, periods of positive voltage and negative current, or negative voltage and positive current, coincide with negative power. These are those periods when the winding returns or supplies electrical power. This reactive interchange doesn't contribute to actual usable output, however it's necessary in establishing the rotating magnetic field. For this single winding, this amounts to roughly 80, 81-ish vars. Given this is one of three identical windings, the motor is consuming three times 81, or roughly 242 vars of reactive power. Compared to the unloaded condition, reactive power kind of stays the same. Given the motor is producing usable output, efficiency rises to roughly 72%. In summary, in comparison to the unloaded condition, in the lightly loaded condition, torque increased, speed decreased, slip increased, mechanical power output increased, current magnitude increased, phase shift decreased, power factor increased, real electrical power input increased, reactive power was relatively unaffected, and efficiency increased. Let's again increase oppositional torque, this time to one newton meter. Speed drops to 1708 RPM, and slip increases to 5.1%. An application of the mechanical power formula demonstrates the motor is producing roughly 179 watts of mechanical power output extremely close to the 200 watt rate of condition. We might be at or about the region of peak efficiency. Current magnitude increases to 983 milliampers with a decreasing phase shift of roughly 48 degrees, corresponding to an increased power factor. As previously, periods of positive voltage and positive current coincide with positive power, as do periods of negative voltage and negative current. 
It looks like the center line of the time variant power waveform increased to 80 ish watts for this single winding. Given this is one of three identical windings, the motor is consuming roughly three times 80, or roughly 240 watts of real electrical power. Compared to the previous conditions, real electrical power consumption increased. Conversely, periods of positive voltage and negative current or negative voltage and positive current coincide with negative power. These are those periods when the winding returns or supplies electrical power. For this single winding, this amounts to roughly 87-ish VARs. Given this is one of three identical windings, the motor is consuming three times 87, or roughly 262 VARs of reactive power. Compared to the previous condition, reactive power did go up, but only marginally so. Efficiency rises to roughly 74.4%. Given this is close to the rated condition, this might be at or around peak efficiency. Things can only get worse from here. In summary, in an increasingly loaded condition, super close to the rated condition, torque increased, speed decreased, slip increased, mechanical power output increased, current magnitude increased, phase shift decreased, power factor increased, real electrical power input increased, reactive power was relatively unaffected, and efficiency increased. Given we're near the rated condition, we might be at or around peak efficiency. Let's again increase oppositional torque, this time to 1.5 Newton meters. Speed drops to 1645 RPM and slip increases to 8.6%. Let's again increase oppositional torque, this time to 1.5 Newton meters. Speed drops to 1645 RPM and slip increases to 8.6%. An application of the mechanical power equation demonstrates the motor is producing roughly 258 watts of mechanical power output little past the 200 watt rate of condition. We might be beyond the region of peak efficiency. Current magnitude increases to 1.3 amps with a decreasing phase shift of roughly 39 degrees corresponding to an increased power factor. As previously, periods of positive voltage and positive current coincide with positive power, as do periods of negative voltage and negative current. Looks like the center line of the time variant power waveform increased to 122-ish watts for this single winding. Given this is one of three identical windings, the motor is consuming 3 times 122, or roughly 366 watts of real electrical power. Compared to the previous condition, real electrical power consumption increased. Conversely, periods of positive voltage and negative current, or negative voltage and positive current, coincide with negative power. These are those periods when the winding returns or supplies electrical power. For the single winding, this amounts to roughly 97-ish VARs. Given this is one of three identical windings, the motor is consuming 3 times 97, or roughly 291 VARs of reactive power. Compared to the previous condition, reactive power did go up, but only marginally so. Efficiency drops to roughly 70.8%. As we anticipated, we're past the rate of condition, i.e. the region of peak efficiency, and efficiency has characteristically dropped. In summary, in an increasingly loaded condition, torque increased, speed decreased, slip increased, mechanical power output increased, current magnitude increased, phase shift decreased, power factor increased, real electrical power input increased, reactive power did go up, but only slightly, and efficiency went down. Alright, last look at motor mode. Let's make this quick. Oppositional torque has increased to 2 newton meters, just shy of breakdown. Speed drops to 1561 RPM and slip increases to 13.3%. Things are super bad. The motor is making sounds like a walrus struggling up two flights of stairs on a hot summer day. An application of the mechanical power formula demonstrates the motor is producing roughly 327 watts of mechanical power output, well past the 200 watt rated condition. Unless our goal is to destroy this motor, we probably shouldn't stay here for long. Current magnitude increases to 1.7 amps, off the charts at our present level of vertical sensitivity. Phase shift decreases to roughly 34%, corresponding to an increased power factor. As previously, periods of positive voltage and positive current coincide with positive power, as do periods of negative voltage and negative current. Looks like the center line of the time variant power waveform increased to 168 ish watts for this single winding. Given this is one of three identical windings, the motor is consuming roughly three times 168, or roughly 504 watts of real electrical power. Compared to the previous condition, real electrical power consumption increased. Conversely, periods of positive voltage and negative current, or negative voltage and positive current, coincide with negative power. These are those periods when the winding returns or supplies electrical power. For this single winding, this amounts to roughly 113-ish VARs. Given this one of three identical windings, the motor is consuming 3 times 113, or roughly 338 VARs of reactive power. Reactive power is starting to go up. Efficiency drops to roughly 65%. In summary, 
in the breakdown condition, torque increased, speed decreased, slip increased, mechanical power output increased, current magnitude increased, phase shift decreased, power factor increased, real electrical power input increased, reactive power starts to go up, and efficiency continues to decline. All right, let's review what just happened. We placed a motor in various torque and speed conditions, concentrating the far right-hand side of the speed torque curve and observed mechanical and electrical properties as we did so. As we transitioned from the no load condition through the rated condition to peak or breakdown torque, we observed the following. Speed decreased. Slip increased. Mechanical power output increased. Current magnitude increased. Phase shift decreased. Power factor increased. Real power input increased. Reactive power did increase, but not dramatically so. And finally, efficiency went from 0% in the no load condition, peaked at or around the rated condition, and then decreased. In summary, everything you would expect from a squirrel cage induction motor. Importantly, we observed plots of time variant power for each of these conditions. Periods of positive voltage and positive current coincide with positive power, as do periods of negative voltage and negative current. These are those periods when the winding consumes electrical power. Conversely, periods of positive voltage, negative current, or negative voltage and positive current coincide with negative power. These are those periods when the winding returns or supplies electrical power. Now let's do the same thing for generator mode. That's what you came here for, right? We should observe intriguing reactions, some similar to motor mode and some startlingly different. How does one make an asynchronous generator out of an ordinary induction motor? Number one, it takes power to make power. Excite the stator with three phase AC from some other established source, in this case, the existing electrical grid. In this case, this machine still acts as if it was a motor in the unloaded state. It rotates at 1770 RPM as previously. It draws 720 milliampers of current with a large phase shift and a majority of apparent power is directed towards a reactive interchange. Step two, grab the rotor and start turning it faster than the synchronous speed. In this case, the prime mover of choice is an electrically driven drive dynamometer, although I could have just as easily put a set of blades in the shaft and exposed it to moving wind, falling water, or expanding steam. Hell, a donkey mill and an appropriate step-up gearbox could act as a prime mover, the point being some external mechanical power source has sufficient mechanical power to turn the rotor faster than it would ordinarily go. Our first data point has the prime mover turning the shaft clockwise at 1842 RPM representing a leading slip of roughly 2.3%. As it does so, it experiences negative 0.5 Newton meters of counterclockwise oppositional counter torque or braking action. An application of the mechanical power formula demonstrates the generator is producing roughly negative 96 watts of mechanical power output. What in the hell is negative 96 watts of mechanical power output? Negative 96 watts of output is a stupid way of saying the generator is consuming 96 watts of mechanical power input. Current magnitude increases to 776 milliampers with an increasing phase shift 101 degrees. 101 degrees? Beyond 90 degrees? What in the hell is going on here? Even when we dealt with reactive components like pure capacitors and pure inductors, we never ever experience a relative phase shift beyond 90 degrees. It's almost like the windings are spending more time with current leaving them rather than entering them. As a consequence of this increased phase shift, more surprises await. As previously, periods of positive voltage and positive current coincide with positive power, as do periods of negative voltage and negative current. These are those periods when the winding consumes electrical power. Conversely, periods of positive voltage and negative current or negative voltage and positive current coincide with negative power. These are those periods when the winding returns or supplies electrical power. Check it out. Where is the center line for the power curve in purple? Accounting for the increased phase shift beyond 90 degrees, it's no longer on the positive side, but rather it's been pushed below the zero axis into negative territory. Looks like the center line of the time variant power waveform is hovering at negative 21 watts for this single winding. Given this is one of three identical windings, the motor is consuming three times negative 21 
or roughly negative 63 watts of real electrical power input. What the hell is negative 63 watts of electrical input? Negative 63 watts of input is a stupid way of saying the generator is producing 63 watts of real electrical power output. It's hard to tell in the slightly loaded scenario, but if you squint your eyes just right, there's longer durations of negative power than there are positive power. This will become increasingly obvious as we increase the rotor speed. The take home point being, we're consuming negative electrical power, i.e. producing real electrical power. This being said, you'll still note that there's an excess positive and negative reactive interchange to establish the rotating magnetic field. For the single winding, this amounts to roughly 91 VARs. Given this is one of three identical windings, the motor is consuming three times 91, or roughly 273 VARs of reactive power. Efficiency is no longer calculated as we did in motor mode. In motor mode, electrical power was considered input and mechanical power considered output. In generator mode, it's flip-flopped. In generator mode, mechanical power is considered input and electrical power considered output. 96 watts of mechanical power went in and 63 watts of real electrical power came out. This amounts to an efficiency of roughly 64.4%. In summary, our first foray into generator land, we drove the rotor at 2.3% leading slip. We observed oppositional counter torque such that the generator consumed more mechanical power input. Current magnitude increased, phase shift increased beyond 90, and we observed more periods of negative electrical power. More periods of negative electrical power mean the generator is ultimately producing more real electrical power output. This being said, a reactive interchange still occurs. Accounting for the change in direction, this generator operates at increased efficiency. Let's see what happens with increased slip. The prime mover now turns the shaft clockwise at an increased speed of 1878 RPM, representing a leading slip of roughly 4.3%. As it does so, it experiences negative one newton meters of counterclockwise oppositional counter torque or braking action. An application of the mechanical power formula demonstrates the generator is producing roughly negative 197 watts of mechanical power output, where again, negative 197 watts of output is one way of saying the generator is consuming 197 watts of mechanical power input. Current magnitude again increases, this time to 969 milliampers with an ever increasing phase shift 113 degrees. As previously, periods of positive voltage and positive current coincide with positive power, as do periods of negative voltage and negative current. These are those periods when the winding consumes electrical power. Conversely, periods of positive voltage and negative current or negative voltage and positive current coincide with negative power. These are those periods when the winding returns or supplies electrical power. If you squint your eyes just right, there's longer durations of negative power than there are positive power. And the center line for the power curve in purple appears to have been pushed even deeper into negative territory, hovering at negative 48 watts for the single winding. Given this is one of three identical windings, the motor is consuming three times negative 48, or roughly negative 144 watts of real electrical power input. Where again, negative 144 watts of inputs is one way of saying the generator is producing 144 watts of real electrical power output. This being said, you note there's still an excess positive and negative reactive interchange to establish a rotating magnetic field. For the single winding, this amounts to roughly 106 VARs. Given this is one of three identical windings, the motor is consuming roughly three times 106, or roughly 318 VARs of reactive power. Let's examine efficiency. 197 watts of mechanical power went in, and 144 watts of real electrical power came out. This amounts to an efficiency of roughly 74.3%. If generator mode was symmetric with motor mode, which it isn't, I'd suspect we'd be at peak efficiency. Even if we aren't, we're most likely super close. In summary, this deeper foray into generator land, we drove the rider at increasing leading slip. We observed increased oppositional counter torque, such as generator consumed more mechanical power input. Current magnitude increased, phase shift increased, and we observed more periods of negative electrical power. More periods of negative electrical power mean the generator is producing more real electrical power output. This being said, a reactive interchange still occurs. Counting for the change in direction, the generator operates at increased efficiency. Are we at peak efficiency? Who knows? Let's drive it faster and find out. The prime mover now turns the shaft clockwise at an increased 1911 RPM, representing a leading slip of roughly 
as it does so, experiences negative 1.5 newton meters of counterclockwise oppositional counter torque or braking action. An application of the mechanical power formula demonstrates the generator is producing roughly negative 300 watts of mechanical power output, or more appropriately, consuming 300 watts of mechanical power input. Current magnitude again increases, this time to 1.2 amps, with an ever increasing phase shift of roughly 123 degrees. As previously, periods of positive voltage and positive current coincide with positive power, as do periods of negative voltage and negative current. These are the periods when the winding consumes electrical power. Conversely, periods of positive voltage and negative current, or negative voltage and positive current, coincide with negative power. These are those periods when the winding returns or supplies electrical power. You don't even need to squint your eyes anymore. There's clearly more periods of negative power where the center line for the power curve in purple appears to be hovering at negative 76 watts for the single winding. Given this is one of three identical windings, the generator is consuming three times negative 76, roughly negative 228 watts of real electrical power input, or more appropriately, producing 228 watts of real electrical power output. This being said, you'll note there's still an excess positive and negative reactive interchange to establish the rotating magnetic field. For the single winding, this amounts to roughly 123 bars. Given this is one of three identical windings, the motor is consuming three times 123, roughly 369 bars of reactive power. Let's examine efficiency. 300 watts of mechanical power went in and 220 watts of electrical power came out. This amounts to an efficiency of roughly 75.7%. If this isn't peak efficiency, we're just past it. In summer, this even deeper foray into generator land, we drove the rotor at an increasing leading slip. We observed increased oppositional counter torque such that the generator consumed more mechanical power input. Current magnitude increased phase shift increased, and we observe more periods of negative electrical power. More periods of negative electrical power mean the generator is producing more real electrical power output. This being said, a reactive interchange still has to occur. I suspect we're at or just past peak efficiency. Let's make sure. Faster we go. The prime mover now turns the shaft clockwise at an increased 1941 RPM, representing a leading slip of roughly 7.8%. As it does so, it experiences negative 2 newton meters of counterclockwise oppositional counter torque or braking action. An application of the mechanical power formula demonstrates the generator is producing roughly negative 407 watts of mechanical power output, or more appropriately, consuming 407 watts of mechanical power input. The prime mover is struggling for reals. Current magnitude again increases, this time to 1.4 amps, with an ever increasing phase shift of 124 degrees. As previously, periods of positive voltage and positive current coincide with positive power, as do periods of negative voltage and negative current. These are those periods when the winding consumes electrical power. Conversely, periods of positive voltage and negative current, or negative voltage and positive current, coincide with negative power. These are the periods when the winding returns or supplies electrical power. There is clearly more periods of negative power than positive. The center line for the power curve in purple appears to be hovering at negative 100 watts for the single winding. Given this is one of three identical windings, the generator is consuming three times negative 100, or roughly negative 300 watts of real electrical power input, or more appropriately, producing 300 watts of real electrical power output. This being said, you'll note there's still an excess positive and negative reactive interchange necessary to establish the rotating magnetic field. For the single winding, this amounts to roughly 140 VARs. Given this is one of three identical windings, the motor is consuming three times 140, or roughly 420 bars of reactive power. Let's examine efficiency. 407 watts of mechanical power went in, and 300 watts of real electrical power came out. This amounts to efficiency of roughly 73.7%. We're past peak efficiency. In summary, this final expedition into generator land, we drove the rotor at increasing leading slip. We observed increased oppositional counter torque, so that the generator consumed more mechanical power input. Current magnitude increased, phase shift increased, and we observed more periods of negative electrical power. More periods of negative electrical power result in the generator producing more real electrical power output. This being said, reactive interchange still occurs. This deep into generator mode, we passed peak efficiency and efficiency dropped. All right, let's review what happened during these four short forays into generator land. We used a prime mover to drive an induction generator rotor at increasingly faster speeds greater than the synchronous speed, and observed mechanical and electrical properties as we did so. Mechanically, we observed the following. As speed increased, leading slip increased, counter torque increased, 
and mechanical power input increased, i.e. the external prime mover had to work harder. Electrically, we observe the following. Current magnitude increased, phase shift increased beyond 90 degrees such that there were more periods of negative power. Real electrical power output increased, reactive power did increase, but not overly dramatically till the very end. And finally, accounting for the change in direction, mechanical to electrical, efficiency increased, peaked, and went down. You observe it among you may have realized there are a lot of parallels between motor and generator mode and a couple understandable differences. The principal difference being that of direction. Motors consume electrical power and produce mechanical power. Generators are the opposite. Generators consume mechanical power and produce electrical power. They do this because while in generator mode, there are more periods when the winding acts like an active source and pushes current away from it, resulting in a net negative electrical power input, which we all know is a funny way of saying electrical power output. This being said, for asynchronous generators, a cyclic reactive interchange still occurs necessary for the rotating magnetic field. I find that visualizing voltage, current, and electrical power on the oscilloscope is a great way of seeing the details of this interaction. Let's talk about some of the similarities and differences between motor and generator mode, beginning with the mechanical properties like speed, slip, torque, and mechanical power. If we were to limit our interest on the far right-hand side of the speed torque curve, i.e. around the rate of condition, you'll recall that increasingly loaded motors slow down with increased lagging slip, increasing torque, and increasing mechanical power output. If we were to plot torque as a function of rotational speed, we might observe the following shape characteristic of a NEMA Design B squirrel cage induction motor for speeds below the synchronous speed. The product of positive clockwise speed and positive clockwise torque always results in positive mechanical power. The same thing could be said about counterclockwise operation in motor mode. If we assume counterclockwise to be negative, the product of negative counterclockwise speed and negative counterclockwise torque always produces results in positive mechanical power. In summary, motors always produce positive mechanical power output. Conversely, generators driven by an external prime mover go faster than synchronous speed with an increasing leading slip, increasing counter torque, and increasing mechanical power input. I know we only had time for four short jaunts into generator land, but if we took more and more samples, we could extend this plot of speed and torque above synchronous speed, we might observe something like this, where synchronous speed serves as an important dividing line. Below synchronous speed is motor mode. Above synchronous speed is generator mode. Your first assumption is indeed correct. Generator mode is essentially a mirror image of motor mode, although not exactly an identical reflection as our previous experiment indeed confirmed. You find one aspect or the other might be horizontally or vertically compressed or expanded depending upon the original design purpose of the device in question. Importantly, in generator mode above synchronous speed, the product of positive clockwise speed and negative counterclockwise torque always results in negative mechanical power output. We all know negative mechanical power output is another way of saying mechanical power input. Generators consume mechanical power. Let's now compare and contrast electrical properties of motors and generators at different points in the speed torque curve, concentrating our attention around the rate of condition, where again the synchronous speed serves as a dividing line between one mode and the other. Increasingly loaded motors draw more current with decreasing phase shift, i.e. higher power factor. Power is the product of instantaneous voltage and current. Increasingly loaded motors experience more periods of positive electrical power consumption. This being said, induction motors necessitate the consumption of reactive power to create the rotating magnetic field, so there always exists equal and opposite exchanges of reactive power. Conversely, generators driven faster than synchronous speed produce more current with increasing phase shift. Again, power is the product of instantaneous voltage and current. Generators driven faster than synchronous speed experience more periods of negative electrical power consumption, i.e. electrical power output. Like motors, induction generators similarly necessitate the consumption of reactive power to create the rotating magnetic field, so as always exists equal and opposite exchanges of reactive power. A quick note on phase shift for generator mode. The observant will note I've dropped the term power factor for generators because certain individuals, myself included, consider it poor form to have a negative power factor figure, which is exactly what you get when you take the inverse cosine of any phase shift beyond 90 degrees. 
while mathematically correct and admittedly explicable, it still gets on my nerves. Some other individuals may or may not have this innate prejudice, so be aware of this fact. Ultimately, a negative power factor is one way of saying phase shift is greater than 90 and more time is spent with the current leaving the generator than entering. Last but not least, both motors and generators experience low efficiency in a no-load state, increasing efficiency as they approach the rated condition where efficiency peaks, followed by a subsequent decline. Importantly, below the synchronous speed, i.e. in motor mode, efficiency is usable mechanical power output over real electrical power input. Conversely, above synchronous speed, i.e. in generator mode, efficiency is usable real electrical power output over mechanical power input. If you think about it, motor and generator mode for the same electrical machine aren't all that different from one another, and any differences you do observe are kind of like mirrored reflections of the other mode. I think the take home point about asynchronous generators is that while there always exists equal and opposite changes of reactive power, average power consumption is negative below the horizontal axis, where negative real electrical power consumption is electrical power output. Above the synchronous speed, an asynchronous generator winding spends more time pushing current away from it than from drawing it in. In addition to demonstrating the mechanical and electrical properties of motors and generators at different points in the extended speed torque curve, this exercise served an additional purpose. Notably, it served to demonstrate how supremely easy it was to make an asynchronous generator. All I needed was an existing three-phase AC connection and a prime mover with sufficient strength to turn the rotor of an off-the-shelf squirrel cage induction motor faster than the synchronous speed. At no point did I have to synchronize voltage magnitude, frequency, and phase shift with the grid, nor make any perfectly timed connections. The squirrel cage induction machine is entirely capable of seamlessly switching from one mode to the other, motor or generator. As we'll soon learn, this is not always the case for other types of generators, notably synchronous generators, while all these complexities must be accounted for using more complicated control schemes. Like I mentioned earlier, Asynchronous generators are an extremely inexpensive means of converting the mechanical power of moving wind, falling water, or expanding steam into electrical power for industrial or commercial use. All right, before we bring this lecture to a close, I'd like to quickly discuss one other application of asynchronous generators besides their obvious application of power modern society. Rather than announcing this application up front, see if you can guess what I'm talking about using this super contrived example. Consider a three-phase AC squirrel cage induction motor with two pole pairs per phase intended to operate at 60 hertz. This results in a synchronous speed of 1800 RPM. In the lightly loaded state, we might assume this motor to exhibit a modest degree of slip or rotate at, let's say, 1730 RPM. One day, while operating in the rated condition, rotating at specified 1730 RPM, we suddenly disconnect this motor from the 60 hertz power supply, toss it in a crate, and immediately ship it across the pond to the EU using a very fast ship. I mean, this ship is super fast. So fast, the motor doesn't have time to decelerate, and upon reaching port, it's still spinning at 1730 RPM, whereby some technician plugs it into a 50 hertz system commonly available in the EU. What happens? At 50 hertz, the natural synchronous speed for a two-pole pair per phase motor is only 1500 RPM. With the rotor still spinning at 1730 RPM, 230 RPM in excess of the synchronous speed, we are in generator mode. The rotor experiences oppositional counter torque and starts slowing down. Any mechanical power absorbed during the deceleration process is converted to electrical power output. Just before reaching the synchronous speed at 50 Hz, we repeat the process. Unplugging the motor and packing it again on a super fast boat, only this time switching the destination to some other country with a 40 Hz grid. Again, with the rotor spinning above the new synchronous speed at 40 hertz, it experiences counter torque and decelerates. Any mechanical power absorbed during the deceleration process is converted to real electrical power output. After 40 hertz, 30 hertz, after 30 hertz, 20, and so on. Each time the rotor is in excess of the reduced synchronous speed, it enters generator mode, and any mechanical power absorbed during the deceleration process is converted to electrical power output. What is this application I've just described? If you said regenerative braking, you're right. Obviously, we're not shipping motors back and forth to different countries with different excitation frequencies, but the larger point remains valid. Anytime you change the excitation frequency for a motor, you're changing where the boundary of motor and generator mode lies. 
while in motor mode at 60 hertz, if excitation frequency is dropped down to 50 hertz, that same rotational speed might now be in excess of the synchronous speed at 50 hertz, such that the machine switches to generator mode and counter torque slows it down. Once it decelerates close to the new synchronous speed, we again ramp excitation frequency down so it's again on the generator side of the divide, such that counter torque continues to decelerate the rotor, exporting real electrical power as it does so. Modern power electronics devices, known as motor drives, use this trick to decelerate a spinning rotor by ramping down excitation frequency during applications which necessitate a quick stop. Any mechanical power absorbed during the deceleration is converted to electrical power output, contributing to the efficiency of the larger system. You note not only does the synchronous speed, i.e. the boundary between motor and generator mode, shift at different excitation frequencies, the vertical profile of the speed torque graphs also shift. This is meant to represent a motor drive's ability to not only vary excitation frequency, but also voltage magnitude. As frequency is reduced, so too is voltage magnitude according to something known as the volts per hertz profile. We'll examine motor drives and volts per hertz profiles in greater details in later lectures. All right, I do believe we've accomplished what we've intended to do. In conclusion, this lecture examined asynchronous or induction generators. We learned a rotor spinning faster than the state of synchronous speed extends the speed torque curve into generator mode, which is essentially a mirror image of motor mode. Generator mode is characterized by a counter torque in opposition to a prime mover's rotational efforts. Negative mechanical power output, i.e. it consumes mechanical power, and negative real electrical power input, i.e. it produces real electrical power. We examined oscope traces of voltage, current, and power for motor and generator mode, and discussed how electrical properties like current magnitude, phase shift, power factor efficiency, and real and reactive power are influenced by the position of the speed torque curve for a given rotational electrical machine. Lastly, we explored a neat application of asynchronous generation known as regenerative braking, whereby reducing the excitation frequency of a spinning motor places it in generator mode such that counter torque, characteristic of generator mode, decelerates the rotor, exporting real electrical power as it does so. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource. Be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.